Hello guys, Guys 90 with Let's Play Fable 2, and in this extra video, I'm going to be covering something that isn't a quest this time, or collectibles at all. And it is found primarily in this pub here. Yes, it's that time again, we're going to be doing the Fable 2 pub games. And we're going to be starting in Bowerstone with the Game Master here who has the pub games, and we're going to play Keystone, the first of the three games available. And so, yeah, we first got an intro into uh, pub games technically before the game was even released because um, in anticipation of it, they released an arcade game on Xbox Live for pub games, uh, uh, of the pub games, where you can actually collect money before the game started and such and such. Now, this video is basically going to be covering the tutorials. You can see, like, there's several options you can play in leaving the table, but let's show off the tutorial with Keystone. In each round of Keystone, you'll be betting on the roll of three dice. One game of Keystone can last for several rounds. Alright, simple enough. Alright, this is the Keystone table. Arch stones. At each beginning of the game, an arch of 16 stones is arranged above the layout. There's one stone for each possible roll. As the game proceeds, the arch stones will be removed one by one. And it goes from 3 to 18. One stone will be removed with each roll of the dice, so we will press X to roll a dice. And we rolled an 11. So that got removed. So kind of simple. You roll an 11 so the 11 stone was removed. So very simple. Now, arch stones 2. The same number is rolled again. A lower arch stone will be removed. Lower means that the stone physically lower on the arch. Uh, arch. The number will be smaller on the left or larger on the right. So basically, what it's saying is that if we get the same number again, the next... If we roll 11 again, I'm pretty sure we will. <coughs> nah, sorry. Yeah, we rolled another 11. So we'll see that little arrow will light up, and it takes away number 12. If we had rolled 10 the first time, and then rolled 10 the second time, then number 9 would have been removed. So that's basically how it works. Arch Collapse. The game ends when the arch collapses. This happens if either one of the base stones, 3 or 18, are removed, or if both the key stones, which are 10 and 11, are removed. The average game lasts about 8 rounds, so you get about 8 throws of the dice before the game ends. Typically. It can end as early as 1 if you're that lucky or unlucky. Alright, so let's roll the dice again and see what happens. Alright, this one was 10, so the arch is going to collapse. And this would end the round. Uh, this would end the Keystone game because all the arches fall away. Yeah, roll the ten because ten and eleven are gone. It ends the game. Now, basically, this game is kind of like craps in a way, and like how that whole game works. An arch bet is a wager placed on one of the arch stones. In this wager, you are betting a particular stone. A stone will be removed before the game ends. They can only be placed at the beginning of the game, and you must make one to start. So this is kind of how the craps element kind of comes into play. Basically, you have to bet on at least one stone disappearing before you finish the game. Now, for this tutorial, they're telling us to put a, a bet on 8, 9, and 10. Alright, now we can begin the game. And you have to do an arch bet before you start. Inside bets. The rest of the table contains single word wagering spaces, also called inside bets. Different wagers have different odds, such as 8 to 10. In each case, the number on the right shows how much you bet, and the number on the left shows how much additional gold you would earn if your wager was successful. So basically, it's going to show us this little overlay here. And if we hold on the left trigger, we'll see it. Now, the number on the left, as I just said, is the amount of uh, money that we will bet. And then the number on the right is how much we could earn as a result. And you can see, the higher the payout, the rarer the thing is. But you can see, like, down at that bottom row there, a thousand to five. So that's a ridiculous amount. You can also see the uh, color coding for all the chips that you can play in this game. But yeah, basically, the smaller amounts are typically the less rare of the two. Alright, so we're going to continue. The second number of each on... Uh, uh, um, tells you minimum bet for that space. You must always bet in multiples of that minimum bet. Some spaces allow you to bet on a combination of rolls. Trips mean three of a kind, pair means any two of a kind, and run means a sequence such as two, three, and four. Keystone is a bet on ten and eleven together. Alright. So, we'll place a bet on eight, black, and pair. Basically, we're going to bet that it's going to be an eight, there's going to be a pair of numbers with the dice, because that's what that refers to, and that we're going to get one of the black stones. 
So we'll roll the dice. You're ready to make the first roll of the game. Remember, inside bets are good for only this roll, but arch bets last the entire game. So every inside bet you have to do, you have to reset every single time. The arch bets will stay throughout the entire game. Alright, so this one rolls an 8. And whenever you roll, all the spots that you want something light up. And you see the amount of things that you get. And we want on everything except for the pair because we didn't get one of those rice, a dice rolled. And you can see like uh, each has a symbol too, either a diamond or a circle, so that's another element. Note that your inside bets were cleared or paid immediately because they were one round bets. However, your arch bets will remain until they win or until the end of the game. <coughs> and so we get immediately collected. This table is this is the table of the first round. The game will continue until the arch collapses. Jackpot rolls. On some tables, there is a special jackpot rule. If the first roll of the game is 3 or 18, then all arch bets win. After the first roll, 3 and 18 are still uh, still end the game, but they won't cause a jackpot. In a jackpot game, all inside bets pay out normally, including bets on the first roll. So basically, it doesn't happen with all of them. You'll have to check the rules with each time, and you can see the setup right here. But basically, on our very, very, very first roll, if we roll either all 1s or all 6s, we get a jackpot. And that's probably what's going to happen right now. Yeah, we got an 18. And so there's a jackpot. So we win all the inside bets that counted, and all of the arch bits that we had in the entire game, since it is technically over. <laughs> but yeah, only if the jackpot rule is in effect, though. And you can see that one in the bottom right there, 1,005 things. That's ridiculous. All right. Oh, it's actually going to talk about now. All right, so Bloodstone. It's a strange variant where instead of betting with the dice, you bet against the dice. And in Bloodstone, you use oversized chips or lammers, which mark every spot you think the dice will not roll. You do not bet with chips because you need too many, because most of your bets will usually win. So basically, in regular Keystone, you have to predict what the dice will do. But in Bloodstone, you have to predict what the dice won't do. However, the payout is kind of in reverse, too. The payouts will be a lot smaller, and the penalties will be a lot bigger. So for this, we roll a 10. You can see all the black spaces indicate all the things the dice rolled, and those indicate penalties as well. So we don't want penalties, but you can see all the victories that we got as well. So, and yeah, because of that, we only get 7 chips out of all that. And that's the entire tutorial. So yeah, different odds and different payouts, etc, etc. And it does deviate between uh, different tables and um, wandering game assets you can find across the game. And uh, let's go ahead and look at stats. I guess we can do that. So you can see like some of the things. This one does have a jackpot, so just wanted to show that. And uh, since this tutorial took a little bit of time, I'm actually not going to go ahead and play it. I hadn't intended on it anyways, but... Because... There really is no point in playing the games in this, and um, I guess I'll wait till the next game to begin that, but yeah, I'm going to cash out and exit the game, and I'm going to go ahead and transfer myself to the next of the games. Oakfield is where we can find a second game. Well, one of the places we can find the second game. The Game Master out here has... Chance game, chance, yay. Spinner Box. Now, just to say this right now, in the last game, you needed to do the pub games in order to get the doll, so you could do that one open-ended quest. In Fable 2, there is absolutely no point of doing gambling besides earning money. Or losing money, mostly. <laughs> but yeah, these are entirely optional. You do not have to do these for any reason whatsoever. Alright, so, we're going to get the tutorial for Spinner Box now. Alright, a spinner box is a decorative box containing several devices called foot switches. Oh, where did that come from? It's a magical spinner that will randomly cycle through a variety of symbols. To play a spinner box, just place your bet and spin. So spinner box is the equivalent of a slot machine in this game. Now this is the Cow and Corset, a three-switch spinner box. There are multiple spinner boxes in this game, and this is just the first of the variants. The weakest of the variant, too. Alright, so yeah, you can see not every spin is a winner. We can keep trying if we want. So it's basically a straight-up slot machine. However, it's trickier than that. Chains. A chain is two or more adjacent symbols of the same type. When your chain appears, you win the goal amount based on the symbols and how much you, get, uh, how much you bet. So we're going to raise our bet to 10. 
and obviously we're gonna get a two chain. A two chain of ta tavern space three times your bet. We bet ten, so we get thirty back. So pretty, pretty simple. Some spinner box, spinner boxes have three switches. Some have four, and some have up to six. Bigger boxes mean bigger chains, as many as six of a kind. Alright, so here's a six one, and now we're going to bet ten on this one. You can see there's a higher opportunity to get payouts in, on these spinners than it is in the uh, three spinner or the four spinner. So we got five toadstools, and we get 600 gold as a result of that. So that's, yeah, you can see like the payouts. Alright, bonus symbols. Some spinner boxes have symbols that enhance the game instead of simply paying out gold. These are bonus symbols. On Cow and Corset, for example, when you get a chain of three bonus symbols, a fourth appears in the middle of the box. Whichever symbol appears on the single switch will pay out as if it were three of a kind. So yeah, all these different, uh, all these different uh, number of switches have different names. The Cow and Corset is the one you'll be coming across the most. Now the bonus symbol for the Cow and Corset is this thing. And when we get a match of three, a fourth one appears. And we get money based on that. The cow on the bonus switch paid 100, which is the same as getting three cows. So what's the point then, I guess? But there's a... well, yeah, you can kind of see that. Alright, on this four spinner box, every coin symbol will earn you a free spin. You can earn free spins whenever you get a chain of two or more coin symbols. You can even earn more free spins while playing your original free spins. So when you encounter four switch spinners, basically, you have the opportunity of getting free rounds. You don't have to bet anything at all. All right, so we got two coins, so we get two free spins. And they get used immediately. On Flower Garden, the sixth uh, spinner, crowns give you a special payout multiplier, which applies to your next spin. Your multiplier goes with each crown that appears and keeps growing for as long as they keep popping up. The multiplier will be reset if a spin produces no crowns. So on the Flower Garden, we're going to go ahead and get a spin right here. And we get two crowns. They earned us a three times multiplier. However, it's not applied to the current spin. It's applied to the next spin. So you can see like this spin times one, next spin times three. You can hold the left trigger to see a list of payouts of all the bonus game rules um, and bonus game rules. To see what different starting bets might pay, you can even change your wager while looking at this list. Um, I guess kind of useful. I, I don't know. But yeah, left, holding left trigger again shows us kind of like the payouts that we get for some of them. Um, yeah, some of the, uh, bonuses and stuff like that. Basically explaining what the payouts are going to be like and, you know, how much if you get, like, a pair or something like that. Mm. My throat's already drying out. What the hell? Alright, so, yeah, we can change, and you can see I'm, I can change the number if I want to. Alright, and there are many different spinner boxes, each with different symbols, blah, blah, blah. Um, Oakfield is always going to be the cow and corset. In order to find the other two... Uh, you, they're typically found with uh, the Roman game travelers in places like Brightwood, uh, Bower Lake, stuff like that. Just find a wandering game master. And since this didn't take very long, uh, just showing that off again, see the count course, it, it'll show the name. I might as well get off a little bit of a spin since I should show it off. So let's, uh, let's bet 10 gold and spin. Oh, nah. So yeah, I have this these suck. Now, if you are down something, you can go ahead and pay your debt with gold. Now this debt, apparently, since I lost 10 coins, I guess that means, uh, 10 chips, I guess that means 400 gold. So that kind of sucks. So yeah, you pay that and you won't get in trouble. And so when you cash out, you basically get a, a, a summary of what happened. Basically, no matter if you win or lose shifts, it uh, decreases the amount of points. And I believe that if you get a higher star level, I think the payouts are higher. I never really messed around enough to find out. Alright, Game 3 can be found pretty much ex uh, unless you find a wandering game trader, a traveler. Um, it can pretty much only be found in Westcliff, but it is Fortune's Tower. Now, this one had a, a bit of an infamy associated with it in the fact that there was a, there was a glitch that was involved with a... Um, in the arcade version of this game in Xbox Live, where you can actually, like, uh, I believe, fix the game a little bit, so you can actually get a crap load of money when you start at Fable 2. Alright, so, Fortune Tower is a game of pressing your luck, played by unique card deck cards. It contains numbers 1 through 7 and 4 hero cards. 
This is essentially deal or no deal. Fable edition. Alright, so this deck contains 8 of each card range 1 through 7. Other decks may contain 9 or even 10 of each number card plus 4 hero cards no matter what. So, and of course, since this is um, an established one, there's going to be 8 pairs of this. The bet, uh, bet to start the game, you must bet a 15 gold or multiple of 15 gold. For this one, though, we're only going to do 115 multiplier, so... Yeah, so 15 is the minimum that you have to bid for this. Now, the dealer will start by dealing three cards. The first card is face down and called the gate card. The next two cards are face up and create the second row. There can be as many as eight rows if you play all the way to the bottom of the tower. Alright, so we'll continue. And he'll immediately deal the first three cards. So a gate card and a three and a six. So this is the starting deal. On each row you have a choice. You may take the dealer's offer or deal another row. The dealer's offer is equal to the total value of the cards in the row. On this row, your offer is 9. And remember that you had to buy a bid 15 in order to start. So if we quit now, we'd be out 6 coins. Now, we can either cash out now or push forward. We're going to push forward because obviously we don't want that. And something happened. Row 3 would be worth 18. But wait, you've also caught a vertical pair. Pairs such as this will often end the game, but not always. So yeah, you can't have two cards touching vertically. Yeah, a vertical pair occurs when a card on the one row touches the card of the same rank on the previous row, as opposed to being neighbors on the same row, which is fine. Normally, a pair will cause a misfortune, ending the game with a value of zero. However, the first time you catch the pair, the deal will, a dealer will replace the card on the lower row with a gate card. So basically, the card at the top fixes us. So it's saved us this one time, and you can only do it one time. If it happens again, you're screwed. Now, hero cards are worth zero coins, however, they keep you safe from pairs. If a hero card appears in the same row, it protects the entire row from misfortune. Heroes can even protect your gate card. So, as you can see here, there's the 7 that vertical paired, but the hero nullified it, allowing us to get a 19 and continuing the game. So, yeah, that's how hero cards work. On any row, you can take the dealer's off instead of dealing another row. Strategically, you should always cash out when you think it's too risky to go on. And it's probably going to, yeah, it's going to force us to cash out. So we got a net profit of four coins. So yeah, we got a profit of four. So not bad. <laughs> Alright, sets. When an entire row matches, this is called a set. A set gives you a mul bonus multiplier, which remains in play until misfortune is caused or you cash out. Multipliers can go as high as eight times. Although that's fairly impossible, but anyways. Alright, it's going to go straight to the third row. And we got three fours on one row, so we got a three times multiplier. And since that row was 12, if we cash out now, we get 36 coins. Now, if you can finish row 8 without busting or using the gate card, you win the jackpot. The jackpot pays the value of every card on the table times the multiplier if you have one. Jackpots can get huge. So it's gonna, this game's going to play out now, just to see. So yeah, hero cards save that. And you can see, like, it slowly builds up. And you can see, the more cards you have, the further you go, the easier it is to have vertical pairs. But you can see, like, it just keeps building and stuff like that. And there's another hero card. And so it made it. And so we get, we would have gotten 360 gold from this one, from just by bidding 15. So that's quite a bit, <laughs> obviously. Now, you can bet in multiples of 15 up to the betting limit on the table. When you bet more, all your wins are multiplied to the match. For example, if you bet 45 gold, all your wins will be times 3. So that was 360 on the last round, so we would have gotten over 1,000 gold if we had bid 45 on that one time. And so this is going to play out right here. Alright, and gate card saved us. Alright, so 19. So, since we bid you know, that much more, we bit four times the amount, it gets up to 76. You can see, yeah, we can know all the stuff again, tips on the, if you hold the left trigger, and we can go ahead and pull the left trigger if you want. All it really just does, though, it kind of gives you, like, a summary of all the rules. You can see all, like, all the definitions for all the things for here uh, Fortune's Tower. So just keep this in mind. It's basically a deal or no deal kind of game, and it can't get risky, but, again, yeah. 
All right, and um, yeah, that went well. I already showed it, also I don't really need to, so I'll back out of this one, I guess. And that's all the pub games. Yay! <laughs> One more thing before I end off the video, might as well try and fit this here too. I'm going to be talking about the jobs of this game as well, and it's going to be really quick. But so far we've seen blacksmithing, but we haven't seen the other two. The first one being woodcutter. Hit A when the target is over the sweet spot, then score a good chop. The faster you chop, the more gold you make. Score 10 chops in a row to build up your gold multiplier. Now again, as I just said, we... I showed off blacksmiths like really early. Oh wow, that was terrible! In the um the playthrough, a wood chopper is or wood cutter, whatever, is the second one. Basically, what has it, it's kind of equivalent to the last one. Oh, come on, jeez, I'm rusty on this. Um, basically, you have to wait for the little dot to get into the green, and it's it's going so fast because I've already gotten all my jobs to level five, so I'm getting a lot of payouts. Now, as you can see, every time we get a chop in. We get paid. So that's kind of nice. And uh, let's see. Just want to keep going on here. This is probably one of the easy. Well, no, it's, I think, the second easiest to do. Like, Blacksmith is undeniably the hardest to pull off. But, uh, and, but there is one thing about this. This is the only job where if you score a yellow point, you actually still continue your multiplier. Or your chain, I guess. So they, it's definitely the most forgiving of the three jobs. However, it's also the slowest when you collect money. So yeah, every ten times, your dog will do a little cheer, and you get paid more money. But again, it takes forever to collect money with this job, so you probably don't want, want to even consider it. And I screwed up, so I'll quit. And because I want to go ahead and show off the last of the jobs, and personally my favorite job, and probably the best job in the entire game too. This is Rookridge, one of the few places we can find this. And it is Bartender. Tap A to serve a pint. The longer you pour, the better the head on the beer. But be careful not to spill. Per, pull, uh, fill three perfect pints in a row to increase your gold multiplier. Now, Bartender, I believe, becomes available as soon as you complete the Spire. And one of the first places you can find it is Westcliff or Bowerstone. And basically what you gotta do is, the bar will fill up. This is the easiest of the ones to pull off, in my opinion. But the bar will pull off, uh, you know, fill up eventually. And when it hits the green, that's when you quit. So it's a very easy game to understand. Oh my god, people are vomiting in the background. <laughs> and of course, you can see, it's very. Uh, this one's the easiest to do just because you get a lot of money, you get paid each time, and stuff like that. Now, if you get yellow in this, your chain immediately disrupts. So, again, it's just like blacksmithing. And, just want to get this one successful one off. If you let it go too far, you're actually penalized money. So this is the one the job where you actually can get punished for failing. A perfect pouring. <laughs> so yeah, it, there's there's the inherent risk involved with this job, but honestly, it's the easiest one to collect money in. So definitely one you want to do, you know, later on in the game. Now to give one final little bit about jobs, these aren't the only jobs you can do. However, those are the ones that involve that kind of mini gameish kind of thing. The only other jobs I can think about that you can do involved bounty hunter, which basically you go out, you kill a bunch of enemies, and come back and get paid. But the amount you get paid is randomized based upon whatever difficulty you have. The assassination society, which is basically the evil version of um, bounty hunter, and then the civilian displacement, which is basically you get a few people to follow you, you turn them into one guy, so they get sold into slavery, and you get money. But I won't be showing those because there's really no no trick to those things. Um, but just to get this off, some of you are probably going to be asking, well, Gaia, what's the best job? I mean, you, you kind of told us the bartender is kind of good, but like, what is the undeniable best way to get money in this game through jobs? Basically, what you need to do is, how it all works is that blacksmithing is available at the start, Wood cutting is available once you reach Oakfield, and then bartending is typically available once you complete this fire. Basically, do blacksmithing until you get bartending, and then just stick with bartending. It's it's easily the easiest of the games to get high amounts of money in, 
Woodcutter is definitely the easiest of the games, but as I just said, it takes forever to collect money in that game. And although uh, bartending is the only game you can get punished in, it's still, you get a lot more money than it's worth. And plus, you'll need to do three successful ones to get a multiplier bonus, so, yeah. So, yeah, just wanted to get that one little spat out there. So, yeah, this is Skyrim 9 with Let's Play Fable 2. That was all the pub games and the jobs that mattered in this game. <laughs> and in the next episode, uh, that... That still remains up to... I need to do a lot of recording. <laughs> Alright, but until then, I'm... Yeah, I'll see you then. Bye.